Good evening. It's uh, February 9th, 2022. We're convening a regular meeting of the Board of Education in the Bonner Ray Media Center. Mr. Mucci, would you call the roll, please? Ms. Prouse? Here. Mrs. Schuker? Here. Mrs. Zetter? Here. Mr. Dobbins? Here. Four present, one absent. On behalf of the board, I'd like to welcome all students, staff, parents, and interested community members to tonight's Board of Education meeting. The board values and encourages public comment on education issues. Anyone having an interest in the actions of the board may participate during the public comments portion of the meeting. Please identify yourself on the board sign-in sheet. A copy of the board meeting agenda is available to review on our school district's website. Please silence your cell phones during the meeting. And would you join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Moving on to agenda item number two. May I have a motion to approve this evening's agenda? So moved. Ms. Shuker moves. Second. Ms. Etter seconds. Any discussion? Any changes? Okay. Uh, we can move to a vote then, please. Mrs. Shuker. Aye. Mrs. Etter. Aye. Ms. Prouse? Aye. Mr. Dobbins? Aye. The motion passes 4-0. Next, we move on to agenda item number three, which are presentations. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Evans, but I do want to thank Mr. Seed for joining us this evening. And we've got uh, David Seed with us from Brins and McIntyre and Seed. And, and I think that uh, the best way to describe David, and, and Mr. Mucho did the other day when we were having a discussion about a meeting uh, with a, a group about a tax abatement and, and uh, Matt referred to David Seed as the, the Tom Brady of tax attorneys. And, um, and, I, and uh, I don't know if you're a fan or not, but, but, I, but that, that's, that's pretty apropos. Um, uh, David has done loyal service for the district for many, many years. Uh, we, we've tried to bring da David in annually to talk to us about some, some of the tax uh, uh, challenges within the district. And with COVID, we kind of backed off it for a year or two. But uh, we thought as we start to come out of this and with some of the recent legislation going on in Columbus that we'd bring David in and talk a little bit about some of the uh, uh, property, um, some of the challenges with, with, our, with our property taxes and, and some of the work that he has done for us. I know you see a, a pretty concise summary from David, uh, but he, he, he's here to kind of person to tell you and then ask, answer any questions. And also with the relevance of HB 126 too, he and I were just sidebarring about here a little bit ago. So David, it's all yours. Well, thank you very much. Can you all hear me or do you want me to move closer for my No, you're good, Dave. Okay, and hopefully I'll not throw an interception. <laughs> um, but um, first of all, I want to thank the board. I've been working with the district since 1998 as tax counsel, and so it's always important to say thank you for the opportunity to do so. Because um, I think I see two new people I've not met before. Let me just explain the process a little bit. Um, this district is heavily funded by local property taxes. I think you get nearly all of your money from local property taxes with some minimal state assistance. That's accurate, yeah. And you have a, a low millage rate. Relative, probably the lowest in the county. One of. One of the well, lowest in the county. Either us and independents are within about a tenth of each other, I think. And, that, and you have a heavy industrial base. At one time, it was a personal property tax that fed a lot of revenue into this district. I think this district went many years without a tax levy and has kept low rates. Um, so the simple thing about property taxes is, you know, think of your own house. You have the county just this year for tax year 21 sent you a letter in the summer, told you about your new your house's value. They didn't really give you an opportunity to complain about your house's value, and you can file a complaint with the Board of Revision by March 31st if you disagree with the value. And homeowners can do that. Commercial taxpayers can file complaints by March 31 of this year to challenge their value. And under current law, boards of education can file complaints until March 31 to argue that the value should be higher not too many homeowners argue the value should be higher. The argument should be lower. And school boards would argue it should be higher, largely on account of a sale. It could be rarely on account of the county. There was new construction, and the county 
missed it or did not put enough value on the duplicate, but largely on account of the sale. It's why the school board would file a complaint. And largely taxpayers are going to file a, de a decreased complaint, let's say on their home, because they purchased a home for a lower price than the um, county's value. So the county's at 200000 and you paid 150 the taxpayer will come in and want a reduction. Same thing with a business. On occasion, a homeowner will file a complaint because county says there's five bedrooms and there's only three or there's something like that or there, there's some damage to the house okay this school board does not get involved with residential cases so we do not file complaints on to increase or to oppose homeowners for a couple of reasons one is most school boards just do not get involved in residential cases that's first second is there could be you know these are your parents and voters that's, that's a good reason there and third is the cost benefit you know to hire a lawyer to, to come in and when a taxpayer is saying their home should be lowered by fifty thousand dollars you know it just doesn't warrant the time and effort we do get involved with commercial properties so we get involved to file increased complaints and we'll do so by march 31st largely due to a sale of the property so I'll be presenting to your administration next month, and they'll be circulating to you, hopefully, a list of properties that recently sold in the district. Um, you know, I was driving here now, I'm driving through Valley View, and I see a few of them, you know, that I can think of. And one in particular, the car, uh, I think the Ford dealership is going to relocate down Canal Road, as an example. They bought property a year ago. That's half of its half of which is in independent schools and half of which is in um, this school district. So we work with independents also and we filed a complaint to increase the value of that property to what the Valley Ford paid for the property. Now if Valley Ford had paid a price lower than the county, they likely would have sought the lower value. Simply when the school board is filing for an increase, it's simply to have the value increased to what someone paid for the property in nearly every case. Um, we have a tax abatement on NIDEC that we worked through two years ago. And that may be an example where we may look at the, we were provided the construction costs for that property. And we might look at that to see whether the county is showing reflecting the proper amount of value reflected in the construction costs that we were provided because there's a tax abatement on the property. But that's a rare example. So most school board complaints in this district are increased complaints regarding a sale. It's more difficult, you know, on, on occasion, you know, we might, there might be something that's significantly undervalued and the school board may file a non-sale increase complaint. The challenge with that is because of your relatively low millage rates, there has to be enough of a discrepancy to warrant the expense of lawyer and appraisal, potential appraisal, to pursue it. And everything is a cost-benefit analysis, which we'll get into. It. So that's one part of it. Taxpayers, commercial taxpayers, and there's fewer of them now will file decreased complaints because they believe the property is overvalued. I don't expect many of them this year from commercial industrial taxpayers because the industrial market is very strong in Northeast Ohio. Um, there'll be some exceptions. I think I was just talking to an appraiser. Some of the office, what you call flex space that you have in Valley View, where you might have some vacant offices. There may be some of those taxpayers that want to challenge the value. But generally speaking, the bread and butter of the school district with you know your single occupant industrial buildings are doing very well. There's demand for steel construction concrete floor buildings in the market um, so now that these are trends what I, I want to show you is the spreadsheet that shows the roller coaster of trends that you all have a copy of the executive summary Going back, I'm going to go back for a second to the Great Recession. If you look back at 2000, 
2009, when I say tax year, the complaint is filed in the year after the tax year. So like this year, 2022, you can file a complaint for 2021 to see on your tax bill. For back when the Great Recession started in 08 and 09, complaints were filed 27, 33, and then 25 the next year, decreased complaints. Many, I think Matt may have mentioned it to one of the media outlets, many of the commercial ta industrial taxpayers came in and filed complaints to reduce the value of the property. In particular, the then owner of the steel mill in Cleveland, in Cleveland, Newburgh, and Cuyahoga Heights, in our solar middle at the time, now Cleveland Cliffs, saw a $100 million reduction in the value of, of Cleveland Works. Charter Steel came in to seek a large reduction. Alcoa, I think they have a new name now. Almet. What? Almet. Almet came in and sought a reduction in the value. They all came in at that time because of what was going on in the market. And you can see at that time, the potential loss of revenue for those three years approached $3 million. In a weak market, the school board, uh, you know, was not, you go to the right side, increased complaints. The school board didn't file many increased complaints. In 2010, we filed one increased complaint. You'll see that this roller coaster, this trend is when the market's weak, taxpayers are very active, seeking reductions. And when the market's strong, the school board is seeking increases. How does this all fit into your budgeting is that when a, ref when a taxpayer secures a refund, a lower value, a lower value, the taxpayer in most cases has made full tax payments on their property. And if they're successful, the county treasurer will issue a refund to the taxpayer and a future tax settlement that's sent to the school board will be reduced by the amount of the refund based on the proportionate share of, of you know, there's the library, the county, the village, uh, port authority, um, and counties. But, so a refund results in a loss of revenue and a future tax settlement. An increase, if we're successful, results in a gain of revenue. If there's an increase, the taxpayer will have in their tax bill what's known, what's called omitted taxes, and they'll have to pay the future tax bill a higher amount of taxes that's then distributed pro rata to the school board. So it works in both directions. So the roller coaster of the economy 10 years ago was huge potential losses to the district, limited increases. More recently, it's been the opposite. You'll see in 2018, only 19 decrease complaints versus 16 and 15, but going back to 12, 45, and 33. And in recent years, the dollar volume of the potential losses has been very modest, minimal. On the other hand, the increases have gone up. The volume of increases has gone up because of sales activity, and so the potential gain of revenue has gone up. Now, you don't have, fortunately, you don't have this here, and I, we represent Cleveland schools. So everyone in downtown Cleveland has a parking garage or a parking lot is filing for a decrease which represents a potential refund. You don't have many apartments in the district, or are there any, I'm not sure. None. What? None. None. But apartments are a very hot commodity in the real estate market today. So school boards that have apartments will be seeking increases in apartments. Oh, there are some like, I guess the expression hot cakes, at high values of out of town buyers looking for investment properties. At the same time, Hotels, um, you know, hotel appearance in Brooklyn Independence, so they're seeing decreased complaints in the hotels. So the ta taxpayers are represented by you know, tax agents, lawyers, appraisers. Um, they all know what's going on. School boards have various tax counsel. It, it's, always, it's always interesting after March 31st that the properties that we expect to be filed on for a decrease get filed seeking a lower value, and the complaints that when we file a complaint, they're not seeking a decrease. That's because the market, the people giving the advice can see which is overvalued and which is undervalued. 
And in the end, there's an equalization process. In theory, you know, if a property is overvalued and a refund is warranted, you give the taxpayer a break, which means, you know, taxpayers deserve to receive assistance when the property is overvalued. If there's uh, a lower sale price or uh, obsolescence with the property or problems with the property and it's overvalued, you know, we, we, we do not want to stand. We want it to be fairly valued, but they should, you know, we're not here to oppose business. Um, at the same time, we want, you know, when the property is undervalued, largely due to a sale, we want it increased to the sale price. So I think if you were to add up this up, you would see over time the potential losses and gains probably equal up. Okay, so any other questions on the global picture of that? Um, did you print the second page of this? Oh. Okay. It's on the back. Okay. Thank you. Now the summary of retention of revenue shows that I have three columns. I have the tax year, gain of revenue, retention of revenue, and revenue not retained. The gain of revenue is from school board complaints. And you will see, those are the ones that we find. And you will see back at the time of the Great Recession, the gain of revenue was more modest. And it's been increasing since the Great Recession because of the volume of increase. The, the columns, the second, the, I guess it would be the, the, the two columns on the right are when we're defending from a decrease complaint. And you'll see going back to the Great Recession, you know, in 2008, nine, we lost one year or more over a million dollars. Largely because we had a compromise. On the steel mill in the, in the three communities, one appraiser was well over $100 million for us, for the Cleveland schools and for Cuyahoga Heights schools, while Arsenal and Middle's appraisal was around $22 million. When you're appraising a steel mill, there's, the appraiser has incredible discretion. Is it, you know, think of the cost, when you drive by our, the steel mill, think of how much of a cost, even though it's old now, think of how much of a cost to replace that. At the same time, if it was closed and vacated, you've seen vacant industrial properties, Think of how little it might sell for on the open market to an alternative user. So it depends on how you're looking at it. And we, you know, we can't do a compromise. Um, so in 12, there were decreased complaints. You can see we largely, we slightly did better than 50-50 on those. And then in recent years, we've largely done fairly well in retaining the majority of the revenue at issue. Um, and in recent years, the school board I think it, for a number of years now, has actually gained revenue that exceeds the loss of revenue. So we've actually, with filing increased complaints, we've made up for any loss of revenue from defending a decrease complaints, which is, a, which is what you would expect, and it's a good, very good result. I mean, you could argue that we're, I'm not sure you would say you're, we're making money, I think that's the proper way, but we're, we're securing additional revenue in a strong real estate market, partially to make up for it. And you go back to the losses of revenue from those earlier years. OK, so that's the global picture on that. I provided you spreadsheets from the last three years, 20, 19, and 18. 18 was the reappraisal year in Cuyahoga County. And in these spreadsheets, I just use 18 as an example. Um, we identify the owner, the address, the parcel number, the land use, the county auditor's value, the, the owner's requested decrease, the school board's value. If we're agreeing with the county, if we're defending the value, then, we're at, then our value is the same as the county. If we're seeking a higher value, it'll be higher the potential gain of revenue, the potential loss of revenue. The decision, the date of the decision, if it's a BOR, that means the Board of Revision, BTA, Board of Tax Appeals in Columbus. And then we identify the gain and loss of revenue 
And so simply, I have an Excel spreadsheet that, is, that computes these numbers. Um, you can actually go to the Board of Revision website and do a search and, and find all the same properties there too to be transparent. Um, so I'm not sure I'm going to go, I think in, you know, we've had, we've had every property. I mean, I could go through them here. We've had the movie theater in Valley View. We've had mentioned the steel mills. And uh, we, probably over time, we've had, I've been dealing with many of the properties in the district. Vacant land, um, when they're bought or sold, or, or someone seeks a reduction in the value. Um, One of the things that we've seen consistently, especially in that Rockside Road corridor, where some of those uh, are kind of warehouse office buildings that that uh, David has gone back and forth with some of those owners because when they're when there's nobody in there they're always looking for reduction and as soon as they bring somebody in then then we're after them because all the values gone up so there's a lot of uh, right at the top of Rockside Road there I mean down the Valley Belt that there's a lot of kind of a David does a great job of staying on top of the occupancies down there and the values and and keeping a check on that for us and and uh, some of those owners have come to us on, on occasion to Yes, let's call David off. But <laughs> well, it's, it's also the I, I understand the perspective. You know, it's I understand. Um, I was at, in a trial today for a property at South Eagle Linder Schools and self storage facility. A bank appraisal of twenty two million. Taxpayer saying the self storage facility should be valued as a as a former Macy's at Richmond Mall should be treated as a Macy's. Do they think it should be valued like it's the vacant Macy's, that's how they want to see it. The bank appraisal sees it as boardwalk. You know, we came somewhere in between. But I understand what, you know, they want to minimize their taxes even, and that's whether they, you know, so they're going to make a strong argument to do what they can, and <clears throat> some will. Some are more aggressive than others. I mean, they get, at the end of the day, um, Taxpayer councils have to deal with one is the clients that want to manage their taxes. At the same time, it's how much money they want to spend and effort they want to spend to how many how, how far they want to push on the envelope to lower the value. Think of the industrial building here in your three communities. You know, you argue that if our the, you know people argue one the tenants the values from the tenant. If we didn't have this tenant here tenants paying above market rent. So if we had a substitute tenant, the value would be lower. So someone will come in with a leased property, thinking fog or other type of owners, they'll look at the lease rates of, of their tenants and look at the market and see if there's an opportunity to argue that the value should be lower because if a substitute tenant was in the property, it would pay a lower rent. But so for the taxpayers, it's still the same issue. Is there enough money at issue to pursue that argument? You know, they're trying to argue that the, the building that's on for $5 million by the county should be reduced to $4.9 million. There's not enough at issue there. This is, we have the same issue, too. In most cases, the county has a fairly good value. It's just with properties in this district, industrial are properties, older industrial properties can be more difficult to appraise because especially ones that are leased because the county does not have the financial information. They do not necessarily know the condition or, or repairs or updates to the property. Um, and um, and you can, and yeah, so that's, that's, so what Tom is mentioning is on Rockside Road is there's the, the you know, so few of the owners have had the cycles of increased occupancy and, and losses of occupancy. And we actually looked at a settlement a few years ago with one of the owners where we agreed to his, re we wanted a lower value because he had vacancy issues. He was upset that we were seeking a higher value where the buildings were full. But we, I think a global settlement was he needed relief for one building, right? It was, va it was vacancy and that made sense. And the other building was largely occupied so at the end of the day, you know, we can, the, our, we, the focus here is to try to protect the revenue of the district to, first and foremost, by defending decreased complaints, to protect current revenue um, from a refund. So Matt doesn't have to report back 
about a big refund impacting your plan. Second is if there's an opportunity to gain some additional revenue, to see if you can gain that additional revenue. Um, you, you, know, you still have an issue as well. There's demand for the industrial properties in this district. Most, many of the properties are now what 50, 60, they're, they're post World War II era properties. So they're properties that someone will argue that need TLC or some are going to be in much better shape than others. And the valuations could go up or down in the coming years, depending on demand and condition. So that's kind of the global perspective. Um, so far, in the recent years, you've been able to retain most of the revenue and not lose and gain some additional revenue. It, it, now, we've talked about Hospital 126, and, and kind of David's been on the forefront of that. And, and just as, you know, this is kind of the third time uh, I think the, the representatives from uh, Fairfield down around the Cincinnati area that this is just... That's a different one. It just one's from the Toledo area. Oh, Toledo area. It's the third time that this has kind of come back to us. And, it, it, and David and I were talking before, it, it's a House bill, so it came out of the House, went to the Senate, and <clears throat> the Senate made some really dramatic changes to it that <clears throat> we had some strong opposition to. It's back in the House that they need to concur. And I was just telling David, I was on with, with the Alliance and also with Vassa, Vassa's Finance on Monday. Uh, and, and they've said that they don't believe that it's that the House is not going to concur with the changes, which means that it would go to a committee, uh, three of the majority, two of the minority, to, to hammer out some of the uh, uh, rough spots with it. So uh, oh, yes. but there's been a real strong push from the education, and, and I, I think if you've seen your emails from, from uh, OSBA, a real strong push with some of the mayors, too, because uh, the mayors tend to not have their finger on the pulse of this sometimes. So I called the mayor and said, listen, you need to you need to be vocal with any of the representatives if you have if you have their ear that this is this is not good policy, this is gonna hurt the villages as well at some point too. Um, and, and Mr. Dobbins and I talked with uh, Representative Robinson from Solon and, and Crossman from uh, Parma both cover our district and they've been uh, extremely supportive of the schools on this it really is in opposition of this. So uh, they've been. Uh, I think you know, the next step for us is from the legislative committee was to wait to see what that uh, what that <clears throat> that house committee looks like, and then bombard all five members of that committee. But you know, this is bad. This is bad legislation for schools. With, with the legislation, I'll get to the most current. The, the version that's been brought up a few times it would have boards of education have to approve. Think of each row here. Of, uh, each row, you'd have to approve a resolution for each complaint and counter complaint, um, and provide notice to the taxpayer before doing so. The way it was initially drafted, the, the last two sessions, we were, these three last, this session and the prior two sessions, was that the school board could approve resolutions for each tax complaint with one vote. The argument being that. Let's say we're going to file eight increase complaints. We have eight resolutions. The proponent's point is, how long does it take for a Board of Education to approve a single call of a vote? You know, they, they, will they take, I think it's Senator from Lake County said, you know, well, the school board truly is going to take the 30 seconds it takes to have a vote to protect significant you know, money. And so that, that was his point, that the school board would do so. Um, the last two General Assemblies, there was a compromise agreed to by the four former Senator Eklund from Jug County um, orchestrated a compromise that would have only required school board approval of increased complaints and no approval of counter complaints. Because with a counter complaint, the school board is merely asking, um, it's really asking the Board of Revision to keep the current value. You're not asking to change the value. You're just, you're not, you know, you're just responding to the taxpayer's decrease complaint. Um, where this is coming from is, you know, anti-school, anti, you know, opposition to schools, taxpayers who would like to make it easier to pursue reduction in their costs where we stand in the way of their success. 
Um, so the arguments have been made, and they're all largely phony. The one's phony is, you know, the, the, the attorneys are paid a contingency fee. So the, and at the hearings in the General Assembly, legislators would ask, you know, school board representatives, do you pay a contingency fee your lawyer? None of them, there are no school board attorneys who are paid a contingency fee. We're all paid hourly rates as school lawyers, like your other school lawyers. But that, that's generally done throughout the state. But yet, you know, the argument can be made, if you make the argument that people are being paid a finder's fee, you're just making that argument to advance your cause. The other one is school boards are taking, attorneys are taking actions with no oversight or involvement of the Board of Education. So what the, the meeting that I'm here tonight for, or I've come in prior years, never happened, right? You all are, would be unaware of, of any tax complaints. That's an argument that's being advanced. Um, at the end of the day, it's simply to, to, you know, they can make all the arguments they want. It's simply, at the end, is to make it easier to get reductions and to keep values lower. Um, I think you've seen in articles in the paper about what's called an entity sale transaction. You don't have, you do not have apartments here. What people will do is structuring the sale often of apartments and other properties. When the property sells for a price higher than the county's value, you'll never find the sell price reported to the county auditor. What they will do is sell, the, the seller will sell his or her LLC, his limited liability company, the membership interest, to the buyer. So Mr. Dobbins could sell the LLC that he owns to Ms. Prouse, um, and simply the argument would be, and the, and the, the asset may be a single, the only thing the LLC owns is, or is a property, but simply by you selling your membership interest to Ms. Prouse, you're not selling the property, you're selling the LLC that owns the property. That's how they sidestep the requirement for filing uh, some sales with the county auditor. And then the county auditor doesn't know about the sale price to the county, does not set the value of the sale price. And absent the school board discovering it, the property will never get set at the sale price. So that's, that's the reason they would like school boards to not be able to file increased complaints. So Representative Marin, who's introduced the bill, did so again last year. Um, it went through the House with the requirements for board approval, albeit you could approve resolutions with one vote. So if there's eight increased complaints or eight counter complaints, you could approve them at one time, one vote. It went over to the Senate, and lobbyists for various taxpayer groups got involved. Um, law firm out of Columbus, and it was very active with some other statewide taxpayers got involved. And then, at the, I think on, in November 10th, I got an email the day before a hearing um, about an amendment that was being introduced the next day. They basically waited to the last second to introduce an amendment to a bill where um, no one would have an opportunity to review it, and the thought was that it would just get approved the next day by the Senate Ways and Means Committee um, with no review. So I contacted at the time Senator um, Senator Dolan. I emailed him, and he was un totally unaware of the amendment, even though he was on the committee. Um, only a few people were aware of it, and he responded immediately that he was going to try and stop it, or he didn't like it. It's in the end, he didn't like taking the school board, limiting our ability to file counter complaints. But we were able to stop the amendment from being approved the next day. Um, school board officials you know, around the state came in and testified during hearings during the next few weeks. In the end, the Senate committee and the Senate approved a bill that instead of barring the school board from any participation in this process, um, approved a bill that limited our participation to filing counter complaints with board approval. Um, because the House had initially approved the bill and the Senate now amended the bill, it goes back to the Ohio House. The Ohio House has two choices. It can concur to the Senate amendments, and then it goes to Governor DeWine, or the House can um, not concur the Senate, Senate amendments and then it go to a conference committee. If you think of conference committee like that every two years in the state budget, 
the House and Senate never agree, and it goes to a committee of House and Senate, two from, two from the majority party in each chamber and one from the minority party. Um, and that's what Tom was referring to, is that there may be some opposition in the House, that this may be, or where the Senate amendments may be, have gone a little further than, than some have wanted, wanted them to go. Um, and I've seen, um, I've seen um, a compromise, or I'm going to call it compromise, I've seen a letter from the County Auditors Association of Ohio that was sent to all the House members. Um, and I think I sent it to, to the two of you that they, they like the original HD 126 passed by the House. They would just want, they did not like, they, cannot, they did not support the Senate version. But they proposed a few changes. One, the school boards cannot file on residential property, increases on residential property. Well, you don't file on any increases on residential property. Two, that there be a threshold to file on, on increased complaints of, uh, I think it was $100,000. And some other changes, technical changes. But would largely permit school boards to file complaints, increased complaints and counter complaints. So we'll see what happens in the coming weeks. The, the House did not concur apparently today. They met two weeks ago and did not take action on it. Um, and we'll see if it goes to a conference committee where, unfortunately, if it goes to a conference committee, it would only be somewhere, it would return to a version somewhere between what the House did and what the Senate did. Um, so when I come to you next year, um, either if we're going to file increased complaints, we likely will have to have a board vote on them and counter complaints of a board vote. And what's good about the timing of that next year is this year is a triennial update in the county, so the highest number of increased complaints and counter complaints will be this next month. You'll see from the spreadsheets that the volume drops down in the subsequent two years. So you would have to approve five or six increased complaints and five or six counter complaints. Questions for David? <clears throat> Is there still a chance that no version of the bill ultimately passes? That, that, there is that chance, and that's something that we should lobby for. I mean, um, So either the, ho the House could just do nothing at this The House point could do time. nothing. They could just sit on it. Mm -hmm. um, I do not know what the governor's position or speaker. Speaker Cup is the, I guess, is the author or one of the co-authors of the school funding plan we have now. Yes. So it's apparently would be sympathetic to school issues and knowing that I'm not a complete expert on the school funding plan, but that because there's a local share component of the school funding plan, it envisions districts like you to raise your local share, in which in your case it's really you you rely on that doing so entirely for your funding. Um, the state of Ohio is not proposing that by taking away this ability, they're going to pro provide another source of revenue to do it. Representative Cup was not in favor of the changes made by the, but when it came to the Senate. So I think what the effort should be is to contact Speak Cup, the governor. The governor had vetoed, the governor of DeWine actually vetoed two tax bills in the budget, not the most recent budget, but the budget um, in 2019. If you recall in the newspaper, Hunting Valley was, there was a tax provision that would have affected Orange schools um, to, to create a lower tax rate for Hunting Valley. Yeah, we, we were present at the Alliance luncheon at OSBA when uh, <coughs> Senator Dolan kind of fell under attack by the Orange people, by the people from the Orange School District. Right. So. <laughs> so Governor DeWine vetoed that. Another bill I want to make, the, the governor also vetoed, and we could, I'll just briefly mention it, because you may have a levy, if you, or you, every school district may have a levy in the future. I don't, I don't know your current plans, but um, one of the, this Representative Marin um, is also a proponent of a pending bill that's currently in the Senate, passed the House. But it would require, currently levy state um, language on a ballot that says, number of mills per hundred dollars of taxable value. Yeah. What he would want it to say is 
the number of mills per hundred dollars of fair market value. His argument is that it's more transparent because taxpayers may not understand what taxable value is. Taxable value is 35% of fair market value. There may be good arguments for that change, but he would like it to be stated in terms of $100,000 of value. It's, you, it could be a hundred. It could be ten thousand or one thousand dollars of fair market value, right? I think the school community believes that by selecting a hundred thousand dollars of fair market value, it will have the effect to chill, potentially chill voters to approve a levy because they'll see the they'll see a sticker shock when they have to vote on a levy. That a voter could still see a thousand dollars or a hundred dollars of fair market and do the math themselves. Um, that bill is currently pending in the Ohio um, Senate. It was passed by the House. Um, so that's another bill that we should keep an eye on for. So Governor DeWine vetoed that. That was snuck into you know, something. It was inserted by the conference committee in the budget in 2019, and Governor DeWine line item vetoed that, that legislation. So twice he's vetoed tax legislation that's been added against school, school interests. So contacting Governor DeWine is helpful. Also contacting, I guess in particular, the Republican um, legislators, if you know any, or you know, Representative Patton, other ones in, in adjoining communities um, who have the majority in the Ohio House. Questions? David, as always, thank you. Thank you. It's always thank you. Thank you. Thank you. super informative and kind of brings us up to speed on a lot of things and we, we missed you the last couple of years and uh, we're happy to have you back here. I think today. it was here two years ago. Yeah, yeah. So. Thank you again. Yep. And when you get a list next month, if you have any questions, you know, through the superintendent and treasurer, I'm happy to answer them. Very good, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Under our next presentation, I'm going to let uh, Mrs. Thrasher uh, do the presentation. Before that, I, I don't know that all of you have met Mrs. Thrasher. She's our guidance counselor. She's in her second year. Uh, we stole it from one of our neighboring districts. And I, I, I wanted to say this publicly, that I had a parent of a senior pull me aside that said three students graduate and actually uh, told me that they had three different counselors uh, for the children because they're kind of spread out a little bit and, and said that Mrs. Thrasher, without question, is the most attentive has done the most uh, uh, most contact that any of the previous counselors that she's worked with here at Con Guides and, and just uh, how refreshing it was for her to stay on the kids and stay on the parents about things that are going on in the guidance office. So how I needed to toot your horn a little bit before you talk to us about the Haney's and, and, and John Safe's place, which we are very thrilled to have and, and certainly want to uh, publicly thank you. And, and we're going to, after Holly's done with a, a little introduction here, we're going to take a field trip and, and go down and take a look at the John Safe space. So, Holly? So, I, I don't really have necessarily a presentation, but I just wanted to thank you, John, very much. Um, thank and recognize this amazing couple and just give you a little background on their story. So, um, I'm a member of the county crisis team and um, do some grief counseling work in some of the schools. And um, in some of the work that I've done, I recognize this space called the John Safe Place and the students were referring to it, taking comfort in it and really um, just kind of felt this sense of comfort in there. It was a very unique opportunity for me to see it live in person. So I asked about it, I contacted the Haney family, family and they have become family to us. So we have become so fortunate and the relationship that we have with them is just so unique. So. Um, they lost their son John um, to suicide and it has been their mission to raise mental health awareness and to create a safe comforting space for other students who may be facing a silent battle such as John and to let them know it, it's okay not to be okay and, and it's okay um, to come down and, and just relax and have that place. The mental health needs of our students are changing drastically. We could say it's COVID. We could say it's a number of things, but I, I can assure you um, that the number of mental health needs that we've seen in gen general has just skyrocketed. So this place for our students, there are no words that can really express what this has done for them. Um, you know, at first there were a lot of questions that we were fielding is what is this gonna look like? Are students going to take advantage of it? And 
just to give you an idea of the process, they do come into the counseling office. 90% of it times it's, they're in tears. So it, it, it's visible that they're heading in that direction. And um, they will check in with our counseling secretary. We'll give them a few minutes. I will enter the room. And even as a counselor, although I have this beautiful office, um, going into that room and sitting on a couch with a student who is hurting and in pain, um, just being in that environment is something that is so meaningful and the conversation just drastically changes. Um, I, I like to give students an opportunity to kind of calm down, work through the emotions. We've seen everything from students who are angry that are like, I, I just need a second before I say or do something that I should not. Um, you know, some of the males will be like, Mrs. Thrasher, just can I go? And they'll take that time and they go right back to class. Um, we've had grief, we've had suicidal ideation. We've had students who are just going through a lot of things at home um, and are struggling in a variety of ways. So we do take that time to work with them. And then um, the one thing that I have noticed, and I've actually heard this from a number of families too, I've had parents tell me on the phone, this is the first time my child has not called me from a bathroom and I've come to pick them up and take them home. Or this is the first time my child has worked through a panic attack and made it back to their class. And I'm not just saying this is, you know, I believe that that room and the sensory in there and then having that sense of comfort and just curling up on that, in that couch in a private space um, allows them to decompress and open up. Um, there are students that um, don't necessarily even know how to put into words what it is that they're struggling with. And they first come in and you say, hey, what's going on? Or what triggered it? They're not ready to talk. And then they kind of give you that motion of like, okay, come on in. Um, we've even had situations where a parent has come into that room with the child and just all of the emotions have come out and they have taken advantage of that space. So um, they respect it. They know the family's story. Um, they are extremely appreciative. The kids keep saying um, over and over again, um, they call it their place. That, that, that's our comfort place. And, and I, I mean that. And it's, I joke around because today I was like, oh, if, if they're coming in, look, we got to clean up. And I'm like, it's clean. I, I mean, these kids have really um, made this their own. And there are individuals coloring in there. I have senior boys that are getting out coloring stuff and coloring. And I have learned more about fish tanks than I have ever <laughs> cared to know. We've got algae eaters coming in. i got a filter. I'm checking the temperature. But now our students are too, and they have all sorts of goofy names, and they're checking in in the morning. So a lot of laughter, a lot of fun. Um, and it's just this unique space. And we love them. We love them for everything that they've done for our students. Um, they have just entered our path at such an amazing time. I mean, the timing of when this has come into our building, into our lives, and it's transformed our whole counseling space. Um, I, I wish I just had a group of students here to tell you exactly what it means to them. And you'll see we have an encouragement board um, in there. But just to give you an idea, we did have a student that wrote this. Um, and at first, we weren't even sure who wrote it, to be honest, because they kind of post these things and write it down. But they wrote, the room helps me calm down when I get anxious or need a place to sift through my thoughts. It's a lovely room to be in with its inspirational quotes, dim lighting, white noise, and coffee couch. John's safe place has been helpful for me to relax and compose myself before talking about what's going on. Um, we have the fidget toys. We have a number of things. And really, my goal for students, too, is you know, if you notice some of them coming down more frequently or if I am able to better identify and building relationships with the students, what their triggers are, I now know who needs the fidget toy and something to hold on to. And hopefully, and I think what is happening throughout all of this is they're learning their own coping strategies, that the music is helping them, being on the couch, um, the manipulatives, coloring. They're learning how to work through it on their own and we're learning how to work through it with them as well. So. I would love an opportunity to show you this place, but again, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. They have donated everything graciously through the foundation that is in the room, from paint to um, the furniture coming in, the inspirational quotes. It was just beautiful to see this thing go up, and the kids poking in to, to check it all out. Um, so we are just so grateful for you guys and so appreciative, and we can't thank you enough. <clears throat> And I have just a letter from the Board of Education, Mr. and Mrs. Haney, that I'd like to present to you. It said, Cog High Schools is beyond grateful for your donation of John Safe's Place that was created within our middle school, high school guidance department this past fall. Having a space solely dedicated to our students to be able to utilize when they need a moment to shed a tear or simply just compose themselves has proven to be an enormous contribution to our student body with many students occupying the space daily. 
Thank you for your vision and mission to raise awareness about students' mental health issues by providing such a place where students can find solace and comfort in the school setting. Your consideration for our school district and your contribution of John Safe's Place is sincerely cherished and appreciated. We are honored to be able to share John's story within our walls of our district. Many thanks, Cuyahoga Heights Board of Education. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I would like us to take a walk down, and we've talked a lot about this. Just
Mm -hmm. um, I just thank you for indulging me with that little field trip. And I, I was just telling the rest of the board, like, yeah, I, there's just, I could have certainly showed you pictures, but there's just, when you walk into that room, even if you don't know anything about it, you just, it has a calming effect. And I, and, and God bless them for the, their mission, and, and we, we're certainly thankful for being a part of that uh, uh, as well. So, uh, back to you, Mr. Dobbins. Well, thank you. That was a very profound presentation. Um, I'm glad we were able to dedicate space for John safe space here in the district. Moving on to agenda item number four, comments from the public. I'm uh, looking at a note. I do not see that we have anyone commenting tonight, so we'll move on to Treasurer's business number five. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dobbins. Um, item 5A, approval of minutes. Motion to approve the minutes of the January 13th, 2022 special meeting, January 18th, 2022 special meeting, and January 19th, 2022 regular meeting as found in attachment T1. Item 6A, uh, motion to approve purchase orders over 5,000 as found in attachment T2. Item 6B, motion to approve modification of the permanent appropriations for fiscal year 2022 as found in attachment T3. And item 6C, motion to approve the American Rescue Plan ARP Homeless 2 Consortium Memorandum of Understanding with the ESC of Northeast Ohio as found in attachment T4. This consortium will assist Cuyahoga Heights Schools with the $1,340.54 ARP Homeless Round 2 grant we accepted during the November 17, 2021 Board of Education meeting. I ask for those motions for approval tonight. So now I have a motion to approve the Treasurer's Consent Agenda items, please. So moved. Any issue proposed? Second. Mr. Sutraki seconds. Discussion, please. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to highlight um, a couple of items. Item 6A, the purchase orders over 5,000. We just have one tonight, and it's for the Bureau of Workers' Compensation payroll true-up. This is all computed by the Bureau of Workers' Compensation. We just input the numbers uh, so they come out with um, what we have to true-up, which is during this time every year for what we have. Um, that amount fits within the budget amount that we have for the entire premium for workers' compensation. So... Uh, we are okay. Items, were there any questions on the purchase order? Okay. And I just wanted to point out, we are taking advantage of the Go Green rebate on that too. So we get a 1% premium rebate by taking advantage of that Go Green rebate. Um, item 6B, modification to the appropriations. We just have two tonight. Uh, we have an increase of $38,000 for the food service program. So we're increasing due to more lunches being served. So in addition to that, we're getting more revenue. So uh, kind of look at it in that light that both sides are kind of moving up in the equation. So by having more uh, free lunches being served to the students, essentially nobody's packing anymore. So um, that's why we're in need of increasing our appropriations. But again, we're having more revenue, so it should even out more or less at the end of the year once we review everything. Uh, the second increase that we have is for $278,787. That's to fund 504, which is the CARES Act ESSER fund. That increase is due to the air conditioning project, uh, which we're paying for with ARP ESSER 3 funds later on in this board meeting. So we're bumping appropriations to approve that air conditioning project for which we have. And the third one is joining the ESC of Northeast Ohio's consortium that they have for the money that was provided by the American Rescue Plan for homeless uh, grants. So we have a uh, modest amount, $1,340, and by joining this consortium, it's going to help us and assist us in spending those funds that we have going forward. Perfect. If there are no further questions or discussions, we can move to a vote. <clears throat> Mr. Shuker. Aye. Mr. Suchaki. Aye. Ms. Prouse. Aye. Mrs. Etter. Aye. Mr. Dobbins. Aye. The motion passes 5-0. Number eight, uh, and good news. Uh, so we uh, were notified by the Ohio Department of Education that we will receive $180,000 to replace four buses. So that's a great announcement mm -hmm. uh, that came. Um, it's reflected in the uh, most recent House Bill 110, uh, which was the biennium, provided $50 million for school districts to replace older uh, school buses that we have. We met earlier today and we are planning to replace four buses. So at the next board meeting, uh, most likely we're gonna have a resolution and kick this into high gear. So our hope, if everything goes according to our plan, uh, we will be looking to order the buses at the end of March. So that's our timetable. By the end of March, we will have all four buses uh, ordered. We'll have all resolutions passed. We will have the budget entered into CCIP and approved by them too. So we're hoping uh, that that aggressive timeline will be uh, 
sufficient. So. And this was not money that we solicited. This was money that was state just, grant. That was a, grant. And the criteria for the grant, and they, they literally went district by like. like District A got one bus, District B got one bus. They, they went through the list and then they came back on the qualifying schools as they ranked them in order. Uh, and, and part of the criteria was the bus had to be more than eight years old and there had to be a certain amount of mileage on it. So if you if you look at the state award, we actually have been awarded enough to buy four buses. Twinsburg, which is about five times our size, is getting three buses. Mm -hmm. So it had nothing to do with the size of the district. It had nothing to do with their budget. Uh, enrollment, it, it had to do Mostly with, it, it was numbers that came right off of the, uh, our transportation report, so. Um, Great. Okay. And we've got until September 23 to purchase the buses, but Matt's already, uh, they met today, they started going through some criteria, so they already have the wheels turning on that. The, the big question. Uh, no pun I'm, intended. Right. <laughs> uh, is that, is that uh, um, the bus companies are not going to have to, they, they know that everybody's going to be looking for a bus, right. so. Mm -hmm. Are, are we going to, you know, what's yeah. going to be the timeline for meeting the needs? And it, quite honestly, from my point of view, is getting for it once, if they spaced it out for us, we would be perfectly fine with that because that would then space out our replacement on them. We're not, mm -hmm. a, we're not a fleet of 40 or 50 buses. We're, we're a fleet of 13 buses. So uh, that's, you know, that doesn't hurt us at all on that end, but we'll, we're certainly thankful for that, that grant. And here's the other follow-up question. What happens to the old buses? In the past, we've traded them in, uh, it, depending on what kind of value they had. Uh, there, there's really, it's difficult to sell them out, right? So the, the easiest route, I, I have to, to believe that because of the number of buses that are going to be coming in, the traded and values are going to be very, very low. Right. And again, these are all really high mileage buses. Uh, if we remember back, we bought a used bus from Bruxville, much to my dismay, uh, several years ago. Um, uh, it, but uh, so other districts aren't necessarily interested in them. And there's only so many buses that can be painted brown in order to go down to the Muni lot on Sunday afternoon. So, <laughs> I, you know. Um, a, a lot of them will end up in Central America. Uh, yeah. They do. And that's, they, they're all over the place when you get down there. There's no requirement to trade in the buses. And even one option we've talked about is let's keep the buses. Mm -hmm. As long as they're in working order, uh, you may have to park four of them out the side. But they're order buses, that's fine. And that will then preserve the life of these new buses that will be coming right. in so that we can look at, you know, pushing that life span out even farther. So mm -hmm. we have a lot of creative ideas today. Yeah. Did you take um, any, I'm sorry, no did you time. take any, uh, give any thought to uh, hybrid or electric buses that, that I've heard about and seen? I don't know how expensive well, they are. I don't know if they're worth even considering. That has been a conversation, asking. but but the concern about moving to something that's more environmentally friendly at this point, and Tom can tell you, we've had conversations about this, they won't fit into our, they won't fit into our building. Our bays. Uh, bays are too small? The bays the, are those small. buses have a higher top to them, and, they they higher, yeah. and, our, and our buses are just kind of get into our, our bus, and we're, we're like the only district that on the planet that stores all their buses inside at night. So mm -hmm. you, <laughs> you have it. Yeah, you don't hear about that's good. damage to buses, because ours are under lock and key at night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah um, and, uh, uh, and we certainly want to make sure that we can continue to use the bus garages. Sure. Good point. Just wanted to ask. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, they, the process started today, and, I, and it's a very thorough process, so we'll take a look at some options with that, too. So. Well, thank you to the Department of Education. Is that it, Mr. Mitchell? Oh, up to me. Uh, wow. yeah. Number nine, Mr. Mr. Evans. All right. Um, a hey, uh, review of the Cuyahoga Heights uh, School District. I don't know, did I have this? No, uh, general business Re review CHS school district draft calendar for the 22-23 school year. Uh, that that's on the table in front of you. I'll circle back around to that. Um, uh, B approve the air conditioning proposal with Gardner to provide enhanced air quality and the mitigation of the transmission of COVID and other airborne viruses. Uh, 10A approve the employment of Joshua Budd as a long-term substitute teacher. BA step one effective February 9, 2022, through the end of the 21 22 school year, contingent on successful BCI FBI background and records check. Um, 11 uh, business agreements, contracts approved, college credit plus memorandum of understanding with Kent State University for 2022 and 23. And I ask that those items be approved. I have a motion to approve the superintendent's consent agenda items. So 
And I guess I'll second it. We can just Mr. Jackie seconds uh, discussion. Uh, the calendar. You, you, um, you see the draft. This is starting days, ending days, and and simply uh, professional development days, vacation days. There's a lot of things to be filled in on this. Um, I, I just had to adjust it last week. We adjusted some of the Christmas because actually we had a little less Christmas vacation time, much to some of the staff members' dismay. But I had to add some time in there to balance some things out. It's 180 student days, 180 staff teachers days, seven and a half. I have one, we have one more uh, day to add to it. And at the end of the first trimester for the elementary, they have a records day. So um, Mrs. Houchin and Mr. Uh, Janitowicz were working on the calendar dates today uh, for their, it's not quite as easy to use because they're not all on quarters. The elementary's on trimesters. We're on quarter semesters over here. So there's a little bit of work to be done with it. And I'll have that to you. Uh, I believe in Friday's update, they've, they've, they've been working diligently on that. So uh, that gets us out the week of uh, Memorial Day, which seems to be a popular opinion. It brings us back or right about the same time. Uh, it's, uh, there are no major changes in it. We, we do, uh, we'll have uh, two PD days and the teacher setup day prior to the start of school. Uh, I, uh, several years ago, we did uh, Monday, Tuesday of Thanksgiving as professional development days that students are off all week that week. So we're, we're going to go back and give that a shot. I know some other districts did that this year with a lot of success. And I, I just dropped an odd day in there. It just happens to be St. Patrick's Day. Believe me, there was no intent on that. But from February through April, uh, with the limited days off, I dropped a day in off on uh, a PD day in March um, uh, for the staff, just as, as kind of a, just to even the days out at the end, because I really wanted to end with a solid week in June there. So it doesn't take us into the second week of June. By check contract, we have to be done by the second week. It can't extend beyond the second week of June. So, um, Mr. Evans, what's the state uh, requirement for uh, student days? We're, we're in hours at this point. Oh, I would say we have more days than anybody else in the county. We, uh, okay. 180 student days. Uh, for example, I think the next closest might be 178, but like Brexville Independence are 176, so they have actually four less student days. And just as a kind of refresher, I think some of you were on the board, we had more PD days and the teachers wanted more contact days back with students and and I see Lindy nodding her head on it. That never happens in education. <laughs> um, where our teachers wanted more time with the kids versus PD days. So uh, about um, um, a contract and a half ago, the, the teacher said, hey, can we get, can we get some, another contact day with the kids back? And the teachers have really advocated for moving the calendar up and not not for any other reason is that it gave them more time before testing took place in the spring. Mm -hmm. So uh, they were of the ilk that, you know, and, and I know there's a lot of conversation going on about not starting until after Labor Day, and there's some legislation about that. And I said, you know, I said, we can start after Labor Day, but understand we're going to be in to the middle or end of June, and, and, and I'm here anyhow. So <laughs> Something about that, too. I mean, if you guys come by in August, there's football, cheerleading, volleyball, band, cheer, you know, like all... There are so many kids on campus yeah. at the beginning of August. Like seventy percent of our high school kids are back on campus August first. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So because they they partake in one of those things, yeah. um, and they they just are. So, yeah. um, uh, and it's worked well for us. So, uh, I'm, I'll still get the random email from the, the woman up on, on Strathmore about why we start before Labor Day, and <laughs> and uh, that's I get it every year, so that's fine. I, I can handle that. <laughs> <laughs> the air conditioner proposal. Uh, understand this is this is Esther money. So uh, you know we had GPD do uh, do the big study for us a couple of years ago before we knew about Esther money before COVID. Uh, GPD in their initial draft proposal to us that had us literally gutting the air conditioning system in the elementary building and putting a uh, a new uh, tubing system in uh, it throughout the entire building. So this proposal, this is to finish off the last six rooms in the elementary that don't have air conditioning. Uh, Matt uh, did a great job of contacting John Britton to make sure that we, to the letter of the rule, meet Esser's uh, so that when it gets submitted to Esser, we went back and forth, John Britton looked at it, we followed Esser's instructions, so those six rooms that we can put air conditioning in, we worked with Gardner on the contract. Um, it's going to be a central control system, so the control panel that's going to go in for that, the digital control, will then be able to handle the rest of the building as we renovate then some of the older parts of the building with air conditioning, so we're gonna, we'll are gonna update the controls, the panel that's going in, we'll be able to handle those at this time. Uh, but it is a univent system, and we had talked about going away from a univent system, and univents are, are what we have, that's actually just the heat part of it, but these are univents that will have uh, a steam component to them for heat, 
the current because the current ones just have steam heat in it, but then also an air conditioning component to it, and it, they'll all tie into a single compressor that's on the flat roof up, up above it, and that compressor will be able to handle additional rooms, not the whole building, um, but we've already got a couple other parts of that building on, on separate coolers over there, but we, we will centralize it as moving forward with, with renovation plans. Mm -hmm. Just to kind of add to your comments, my understanding is that one of the trade-offs or compromises of doing this now is that by using Univents, they generally have a shorter lifespan than, say, a more integrated, centralized system that had been contemplated by GPD's uh, site plan. They, they do. Uh, so and these ARV units are, were the higher end of the Univents mm -hmm. uh, systems. And, and people, and just to, to understand, if you go in the building, you'll see Univents everywhere throughout the district. They're in my office. And I think people think that those are bought off the shelf, and they're not. One of the reasons for the approval right now is there's about a 14-week lead time because they go in and they measure the rooms. They're built individually for each room based on the size of the room and what the capacity they have to serve so they know what they have to put in there by the heating and, and air conditioning uh, uh, coils within that unit. So there, there's some front work to be done on that. So that's why it's on the work session. It didn't wait because we want to get this back to Gardner so they can start uh, getting the order in to, to build the unit vents. Okay. So what is the timetable, do you think? We're, we're going to, that's why we're here, so, so we can get, uh, because the, the, obviously the number one question is, are you going to be done before we start school? And, and that was yes, provided everything comes in on time. And they're telling us they're not having supply issues right now with, with some of the HVAC equipment, so that, that their things have been coming in. And they're, they kind of let us believe that they're padding their numbers a little bit, too, to, to give themselves some wiggle room on this. So, we'll, but we'll keep the board up to date on this because believe me, we'll, we'll be checking. On the, and we're going to bring GPD on to oversee the. the, the now they'll have they want to have their, they'll have their own site engineer here, but we want GPD to oversee this because in the, ultimately it's going to work into the entire renovation plan in the district. And and we'll be meeting with Jason Moldy uh, next week to, to talk to him about what our expectations are on this. So that kind of gives us our own little separate pit bull to say, hey, where are you at on this? And Jason will keep us updated on on, on the progress of that. Does this use up all the ESSER money for this particular? This is the last of it. So this, essentially, we had designated some for some other areas, and, and we said, well, kind of what's left in that pot, and what are our options? And that okay. we try to match what was left with what was there, and, and that's what we did with this. So okay. I, there's a little bit of room. No, may ask no, Matt. We're, we're, we're right, at the, right at the end of the ESSER money. Okay. The, as far as, I'll, I'll circle back around to the SR, SR conversation after we get some of this approved. Uh, Josh Budd started this week. He's worked side by side with Doug for a couple of days. Uh, exciting young guy comes, uh, I think, graduated uh, maybe in the fall. He did a long term sub for Nordonia. Casey Wright's a good friend of mine. Some wonderful things about him. Um, um, Doug Amari's been on there with him the last couple of days and going to kind of uh, cut the cord tomorrow. And, and, and Josh's on his own. But, uh, um, uh, excited about what he's going to, you know, we're bringing that long term stuff in there. Just so the board understands that there was no promise or expectation that that would automatically transition. So Josh knows that we are starting next week interviews for the full time position mm. um, because we're doing a search for that. We're, we're actually reaching out to, to some maybe some venues that we haven't reached out to before to try and attract some candidates for that position. So still excited to be on, be on board though. And the College Credit Plus is uh, that's with Kent. We haven't used them the last couple of years. We had a student that used the the Twinsburg campus, and, and this was a little laughable because Kent sent this to me and said we need it back by two weeks before the date they sent it to me. <laughs> so I called him. I said, Well, we won't be approving your your CCP agreement because I have to have it board approved, and you wanted it two weeks ago, and I got it yesterday. And so. She stuttered and stammered and said it was a delay. I said, well, you just understand, we would gladly do this, but not, that you'll get it when we get it approved and signed, so. <laughs> <laughs> There's no other discussion. We can move to a vote. Mrs. Shukert. Aye. Mr. Suchaki. Aye. Ms. Bruss. Aye. Mrs. Etter. Aye. Mr. Dobbins. Aye. The motion passes 5-0. Uh, Mr. Evans. Yeah, uh, I, some, just some other updates. David did a great job in 126. I won't go back over that. Had a BASA uh, Finance Committee meeting. Uh, the state, as far as ESSER is concerned, uh, several states have gone to a, an ESSER dashboard uh, so they can see where the state fundings go. They, they, so Aaron Rausch, uh, who Matt talks to on a regular basis from, this, from ODE, uh, uh, we're, he said there's no question that we, we will go to that in Ohio and it'll list our district. It lists how much we got for ESSER 1 and what, how much we spent. 
what we got for us for two and how much we spent and, and the different things. So it, it's, but that, that's coming on the state level. There's still $3.5 billion of ESSER money to be determined. Uh, understand that when the ESSER money is distributed to the state and it's supposed to go to schools, the state holds back a certain amount of that for things that initiatives that they want to do. So there's still a pot of ESSER money yet to be distributed. We don't know what that's going to look like. Um, uh, we do know that it's going to look like better, bigger internet for the ITCs, and that's, I think that should make Dave smile a little bit that, uh, <laughs> that our, that our offsite Neonet's going to get uh, some, some more expansion, some help from the state on that. Um, do they have a deadline when they have to spend that money by the state? Or just start uh, yeah, the, with the, the, yeah, the, the federal times, and I don't know what the, the yes or two money is, so that'll be real interesting to see how that kind of rolls. It's, it's, they're slowly starting to trickle out, and this kind of circles back around the conversations that you've probably heard me say ad nauseum. They're tying a lot of things to grants, that's, so that's going to be the state's way of saying we gave you additional funding by, by giving you this grant, and then you have to account for every penny pound of Deutsche Mark individually, so as opposed to just giving us foundation funding money for us to run our school district. Yeah, and we've already seen that pattern with the wellness funds, mm -hmm. but I think we're going to see more and more of that. And and I don't, Matt will have less and less hair because of that, because <laughs> that, that becomes uh, very time-consuming uh, uh, on his end as far as getting it approved through CCIP and then coming back around as, as now is almost a daily basis for for him and, and Mr. Young. So, um, uh, Matt, talk to you a little bit about our foundation. The, the we heard about the foundation formula. Uh, the first. Uh, Product that we got back, we it said that we owed the state one hundred twenty-three thousand dollars for next year. So I brought the yeah, that was. That's <laughs> my giggles when you're talking. And so so I, my, what I asked Aaron Roush about, and I didn't want to put Aaron on the spot with seventeen other superintendents on a Zoom meeting, was that why? Because they said no one was going to get less funding. So why didn't you just not try to rush and put the formula in place and for the first February payment, just use last year's number and give them that percentage that you would have normally given them on. February 1st and taking more time to make sure you got all 612 districts correct. And he, he did inform me, he said, he said that the February 1st payment was correct, to which I asked Matt, and Matt said, I don't know, I haven't seen the formula yet. So uh, they're in the process of trying to post the formula, so we'll, we'll, we'll know as that goes. Remember that the phase-in for the funding plan is a six-year plan, so 16.67 this year, next year, the year after. And that is if the next budget mm -hmm. has this plan in it. There's nothing that says that this will funding plan will stay in the next budget. So we're still at the bay there. Um, the free lunch, uh, the free lunches for this year started about this time last year. Uh, Aaron told us that there's no indication that the legislature has any uh, initiative to continue <laughs> that on for next year. So we need to plan as if we're going to be back to our regular lunch program for next year. That's the, that's what I got from. Supposedly there was a, if you're ESSER, some schools didn't get ESSER money because the third time around because they used it, they, they, um, it was off of your Title I funding and some schools don't get Title I funding. So every school got bumped to a minimum of $1,008 and we're in the process of trying to see if where we were at in that continuum, if we got a bump up to that minimum per student, $1,008 per student in the district and, and, uh, and we'll try to pull those spreadsheets up to see exactly where that, that came out. Um, we talked about the mileage and that and that uh, uh, on the buses and that's what they use in that formula. Um, staffing update. Uh, I just told you about social studies. Uh, I know that Mr. Janatovich interviewed three uh, candidates for world languages: two Spanish, one French. Uh, that on paper all looked outstanding uh, coming in today. So we're excited about that. Uh, he kind of asked me if there was a preference about whether it be Spanish or French, I said, I want the best teacher in the building possible. I'd love to see two languages. Uh, quite honestly, I'd love to see the, for the students to have an option with the language, but I want to hire the best best. So we already have Spanish, so. Right. That's why I'm leaning towards, I would like French, I would like a second language. Okay. But we know that, we had talked about, and you heard Mike talk about, if, if it was a, to expand if it was right? Spanish, we would, ex, we would okay. move it down. And either way, I think we're going to move some language immersion down in the elementary middle school. Did you see that Mr. Budd um, speaks Italian? He spent time in Italy. He, he, he actually, he, in his yeah, application, yeah, he, he says fluent. He, yeah, he, well, because he lived in Italy yeah. for a period of time. Yeah. It says that too. doesn't mean you could teach it. <laughs> yeah. I know. Just, I'm just, just, it just years. makes Mrs. Ever happy. I would love to see Italian talk somewhere. They could have an Italian club and they could do it, yes. you know, yes. <laughs> informally. Um, 
teachers' aides, we're filling a couple of teachers' aides positions. Mr. Burke had some uh, uh, some good candidates in there, so we anticipate bringing out some teachers' aides to fill some open spots. Mascot committee update. I, I was. Uh, I'll, I'll probably leave that to uh, Mrs. Schuchert because she's on the committee. I, I kind of stepped back and, and I was an observer, and I got the meeting started. I talked a little bit about some things, and I kind of let the committee do. Uh, do their thing. I thought that the, the, the two meetings have moved along very well. I thought there's been some really good conversation. Uh, there'll be one more meeting. Uh, I, I'm just going to throw it out there to the board. We have said we would bring five, five possibilities back to the board. We didn't say how, and I didn't tell the committee how, what, where. Uh, there's going to be some options. I told them, I said, if the, if the committee feels like these two are stronger than the next two, then feel free to say that to the board when they submit them. Uh, there's also, I throw out the option of one, once we get to five to, to maybe ask the students how they feel about them, a one time through vote with the students to see how they feel about them. Strictly at the board's discretion about how we want to move forward that you, you're going to get five. Members from the committee are going to present each, each uh, mascot will have a different person presenting on that mascot at the mm -hmm. uh, March board mm -hmm. meeting. So you'll be able to hear from them the rationale of some of the conversations that took place. And I think it's been a really good conversation. Uh, uh, quite honestly, moving through, and I, I don't know if you feel the same way or not, Lindy, but I, I... Can I just add, I really don't think it should be a board decision. Okay. I would really like to see this committee, because it's made up of, I think, 29 people, alumni, staff members, I represent the board, or myself and the parent, students, administrator? I mean, you're, you're an administrator. But I, I'm, I'm in ad hoc. I, I've really not... Okay, I'm just... I'm so just I didn't vote on the second round. I, did, I, okay. I stayed out of it, because I didn't... But I... I in talking with some of the committee members too, it, personally, I, I don't want to hear the slack that we picked something. I, I don't. And it, so this committee has done the work. They have investigated. They have researched. They have. You should hear the conversations we have about animals. I've learned more about <laughs> animals <than> the conversations <laughs> and what they do and what they're, you know, what their lifestyles are and how they go after their prey. And I mean. <laughs> So, so they're really like doing their work. We haven't talked. We've talked like how to um, how to brand it. We've talked about how sports teams will use it. We've talked about how it will sound like in Cheers. How it will. I mean, we have we have really taken as a committee every name and really delved into the reasoning behind the you know everything. And so I would hate. To just be, again, maybe I'm just afraid of social media, maybe I'm afraid of people in this community, or maybe I just don't want to deal with them. But I just don't want to have five, five it come down to five things, and us five, some of us with kids in the district, some of us without kids in the district, have to, you know, be taunted the way we've been taunted in the last two years. My intent was to leave it open, like, depending on what the feelings of the board, because I, I, I'm fully comfortable with the committee saying, this was our number one choice. Mm -hmm. This was our number two choice. This was our number three choice. This was our number four choice. And this is our number five choice. I'm, I'm fully comfortable with that, unless there was some major disagreement. I, I kind of wanted to leave the door open in case there was um, uh, something. To give you more background, you know. too, it's really, at least in the first two rounds, there are two to three that really stand out. And then there's like a couple tricklers. Mm -hmm. So to come up with five, I don't think, I don't want to speak on behalf of the committee. But you're not going to have five that are equivalent. Mm -hmm. I, I would there agree are two hardly. that are very that are very There's similar two that, that are, are very from the conversations from the from the last two conversations. So, do you think people, that, it you know one of the members threw a spreadsheet up on there that had done mm -hmm. of of the remaining twenty, and it was a, they really have done their home. So people have taken this at, to heart. They're looking at the background. So like, can this be interpreted as racist? Can this be interpreted as violent? Can this be is it gender gender neutral? Like, again, there's so much. Like, I really appreciate the work that's gone into it, and that's what the, the spreadsheet really showed. Mm -hmm. You know, also, is it how many, we have people that have researched, like, how many sports teams in Ohio or in the nation, and, mm -hmm. you know, one name, like, Warriors. Well, a lot of people don't like the Warriors because that's, you know, one of our rivals in, in basketball or whatever. So, I mean, there's been a lot of conversation around each of these words that's considered. Do you believe that the committee will want to, will be able to rank them? They're already ranked. Okay. I mean, they're already that's... ranked by, you know, they were down to 20 or a little over it's, 20. I think six is what voted. came out. There was six, so there was really, if it was going to be five. And, and I, I left the door open because I didn't want to 
pigeonhole that until I talk to the board about that. And I'm glad Lenny's speaking up on that. And, um, about that, and I think the other aspect to this is there's a lot of people on that committee that were not in favor of the, of the old mascot mm -hmm. going away, but they understood and they've tried to make a real positive contribution to this. And I can't commend those people enough because it, I, in my eyes, while they didn't like the decision that we made, they've been very positive about moving forward and some of the choices right. and been very logical about about going about this. And I, I, I have a, a, you know, I just think that's been really good too. So, so what they did, there was about 20 something, then the people on the committee, so you had 29 people could vote for their top three. And that list, when we talk about ranking, was very clear. There were, I would say, three that had, you know, majority vote. Mm -hmm. And then there were a couple that were like medium. And then there were a lot that either had zero or one. So there was so 13 that had about, zero or one yeah, vote. So we had so that was easy. Yeah. It was obviously, our, we could yeah. mix those and, and really delve into the root behind the meaning behind these last couple ones. Okay. So I, I, I honestly see it being narrowed down to under five. But I, I personally I'm, don't I'm want fine to with that, but I didn't want to remember as to what to keep. I also wanted the committee to have some autonomy to do that, but I also wanted the board to be, be able to have a little bit of, to know what was going on mm -hmm. prior to that happening. So, mm -hmm. that. I, I, I completely agree with you, Lindy. I personally don't think it should be up to us. I would love to see the students mm -hmm. get to vote. So mm -hmm. maybe the committee takes the top two or three, and then every student from like elementary through seniors, they get to vote, and that's the one. And I think that maybe also mitigates some of the parents who maybe were upset about it, you know, that, well, my kid got a chance to vote and the kid can take it home and say, this is really exciting, like, we get to pick, like, there's, you get more And then when you're involved in, I mean, you think about yeah, it, when Jordan was involved originally, yeah. then you have this committee, I mean, there's been the, the board meeting where we allowed the community to talk about it, and then the students get the final vote, that's kind of a cool idea. Yeah. But would they also get some of that background that you're talking about that's been well, we'd set it up. We would, I would, we would make sure that... Yeah, that, I mean, that, again, that a red wolf, I mean... How we can, I, I we can record know. the presentations <laughs> by the by the committee members and, and with, yeah. with the rationale. I mean, that we could Zoom... We could zoom those and uh, and record them, and then we could have them shown in classrooms or have them shown at convocation. Or yeah. I think um, it's the responsibility of the committee to do the vetting. So if yeah. if we're comfortable that the top three or whatever has been fully vetted, there's no issues, no trademark, whatever, yeah. then it yeah. doesn't really matter which one. I mean, my daughter's going to pick the one that the coolest animal. I don't know if she really care about that, but as long as we go in comfortable mm -hmm. with the vetting, then I, I don't think it really matters. And you have a good point, because that was a huge thing, too, the trademarking and what can we do, because there were some awesome things on there, but we learned through research that the trademarking on it might make it more difficult mm -hmm. in the future. So thank you for bringing that up. And, 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 and I talked to John, and, and, and I had volumes of paper. I was running off trademark stuff. I said, this is crazy. This is way beyond my scope of <laughs> figuring this out. But I, so I talked to John Britton about it, and John said, he goes, he goes, and he was going to look at it a little bit more. He goes, he goes, traditionally, the the images are what's trademarked, not the name oh. itself, that they can't. It's like, like Buckeye, Buckeye was the one that really came to mind. It's like, in Nelsonville, York are the Buckeyes. But Nelsonville, York doesn't use any of Ohio's. They don't use a, there's no Blocko, there's no Brutus Buckeye, there's no Buckeye Leaf. Because Ohio State has trademarked all those items. Mm. So Nelsonville, York, Buckeyes are actually, they use like the New York Yankees. I don't know why the Yankees don't go after them, because it's the <laughs> NY. It's, it oh. really is the New York Yankees, NY, and, and it says Buckeyes underneath it, and their colors are like brown and orange, so there's no trace back to, so on that end of it. So he goes, that, that, that's where the fear comes in. And he said, quite honestly, and I gave the example, some universities are more proactive about than others. I know Bay High School is the Rockets, Toledo saw the rocket that they were using and Toledo went after them and said, that's our rocket and that's trademarked. You can be the rockets, you can't use that rocket. Yeah, so, Garfield Heights, I think, had that too with their bulldog. The bulldog's tongue, the way that it was hanging, and I'm probably saying this wrong. So no, you're correct. It, but they had to like change the way the tongue or the color of the, the tongue. <laughs> they, had to, they had to change the color. I'm telling mean. you, not about animals. <laughs> yeah. so, can I ask a question? Absolutely. And I don't know if this is the right forum, but I never do. Um, with this, the process, the, we haven't talked about the artwork on it, so I, is that committee, is that us, is that uh, you guys? Mrs. McPherson is coming out of her skin okay. right now. Okay. She was looking right. over my shoulder at the final six. She's re she's poised and ready and has her, her students are chopping at the bit to, to start wait. to creating some images okay. or whatever it might be. And she goes, do you want me to do them for the six? No, no, no. We're going <laughs> to, you know, and, and, and really, she as soon as we started this process, she was... 
one of the first people in my office said, "We can, we can do that." I said, "We're, we're gonna, you're gonna be involved, Hallie. Just we'll pull back a little bit. We're gonna, we're gonna have you involved." So I, they're, they're really excited about taking this on. My other question is, what about all the paraphernalia that is still up that is red skin? Um, is there, I, and again, this doesn't need to be answered right now, but is there a timeline as to when, because there's things as simple as things in teachers' rooms that could be easily taken down versus things that might be harder to remove, you know, versus things that are structural that <laughs> are even harder than harder to remove. So just, yeah, just we're looking at out there. In, in, for instance, the basketball floor gets done this year, so that will, that's an easy fix because we're going to be done before the end of school year. That floor gets done in March. We can take the Redskin off there and whatever, the new logo, if we want to, or if we want to put a flip on it because it's the flip sign or gymnasium. But the floor is due to be done this summer. So as those things go, as we do rooms this summer, we can do that. I will tell you there's kind of been a feeding frenzy for some of the old stuff. That If, if you've been in the pool and you know that big Native American head that's there, I've had at least three people in one city call me and want it. So, um, wow. you know. Glad I don't live there. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, Can I ask too, so also maybe like I just received as an athletic booster member a Redskin shirt. I'm sure that was a gift from someone. But, I mean, can we maybe stop giving those kinds well, of things? Well, I apps? told them to two years ago to not order anything else. So, supposedly... And I know that what you got is new, but supposedly there wasn't anything new being ordered with the Redskin head on it. Uh -huh. So, no, I, just, I give it. I mean, I'm, I'm just hoping that there's some sort of consistency with respect to really, you know, and whether that starts in August when kids come back, it's a new year, it's yeah. a new mascot, but I'm just hoping that there's, there's communication, you know, and not only to staff, but also to students and to community members yeah, when that will be moved It's been back. reiterated to a couple staff members already uh, about, you know, this is no longer our, so you need to do whatever you're going to do with it, so we're done having that conversation, but, um, and we've already started, uh, we started with the uniforms two years ago, mm -hmm. and w when when we went to the Block CH, so, you know, that, I knew that, you know, that half million dollar number was going to come up for one school to replace, all that. we weren't, that's, that's not, and our plan has always been to replace them through normal, I, I, I will tell you, I did use some grant money this year to replace the wrestling singlets because everything they had had the Redskin head on it. So I, and they looked like we didn't have a set of singlets. We looked like the biggest ragtag bunch. Of, so I, I, I took it upon myself to make sure I ordered enough singlets for the entire program, high school and middle school, for everybody to be in something that had the CH logo on it and that type of thing. So the coaches have all been really good about it. So no, nobody's walked down it try to sneak anything in that they, they, they know where we're going with this whole thing. So, mm -hmm. Last thing I had was uh, um, mask mandate. Um, you know, we have not had a, an in-school transmission since early January, so I was going to go to optional mask beginning Monday. Uh, I just wanted to let the board hear that first. I, I, I did, I told, as I told Mr. Dobbins, I said I didn't, didn't want to be the first one, and I maybe don't want to be the last one. Mm -hmm. I know uh, some districts around us Previously, have dropped the mandate, but we'll we'll go to optional mask beginning on Monday. Is that just for the high school and the middle school? Um, Mrs. Hodgson said the elementary is okay with. So I think what I, I think the wording I'm going to use is going to be strongly recommended. Continue to be strongly recommended, but it is the it is an option. So. So going back to the uh, to the mascot conversation, do you or Mrs. Schuchert, as representatives of that committee, do you need any more guidance? I mean. No, I, 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 well, I, like I, I, I would as prefer possible. to, and have I think I've got what, what the message that's being said. I, w I would ask Lindy not to do that because she's Wait, what am I, what are you just trying to direct the group about where we want to go from here with the mascot. Yeah. But, but I, th I think I would, because what I've done is I've, made, I've stayed clear of, I like this one, I don't like that one. Yeah. I don't think anybody mm -hmm. in the group would say he spoke, I mean, I spoke on behalf of one that because the person wasn't there. And, not necessarily anything I was in favor of, but I just gave the rationale why that was on the list. So I, I, what I've done is try to be that part of the facilitator to say, okay, I've talked to the board, here's what, here's the direction we want to go. We're looking for, for uh, you know, if, if you have a top two, a top three, then we're going we're gonna to forward it to the student body and see what the student body says about them. Uh, but we want also, then we want presentations from people that want to present on those three that will record them via Zoom or whatever and show them in classes and show them in convocation. And then, let, let, give, set a time for the students to get a vote in on it and then 
come back with from there? Well, I, I guess what I'd like to do is be more couched in the sense of ratifying something that the committee mm -hmm. has done to yeah. collective input Absolutely. as opposed to yay or nay. It. I'd rather no, that, that's you'll, that's you'll, so what will come is that this is this okay. is what the committee and the student body came up with as 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 the the next the recommendation. For the school district. And right. will they? Pre but okay, so now I'm confused. Will the committee? present first and it, some right. way here's what we have for three that we're, we're, that's going to go to yeah. the student body they were excited about presenting so, they were I, they, 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 I was, I was shocked was, I was shocked because there were really people really kind of lobbying for being the one that was <laughs> on a certain I'm telling you you're going to learn about animals like you've never to be the salesman it was it was it was, it was, it, it was uh, I, again I kind of tried to take a back seat on it uh, but it was it was very fun to sit and look, kind of just <laughs> Absorb the conversation. So we're just going to hear it, but we're not going to take any action. It's no, going to go to this no, you're going to know what, what the perfect. committee, what they've done, to narrow it down, and, and 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 their rationale for coming up with them, and then we're going to that'll go to the student body. Great, thank you. Good, yeah, I like it. Thank you. Thanks to you too. And I, and I, I thank you because I that was kind of my approach coming in. That's what I wanted to run off, and I'm glad, Lindy. And I, meanwhile, I'm on Zoom, and my kids are like peeking to see what are they saying? <laughs> What's the next thing? Well, That's you're not alone with that, though. I, I think I know. I've seen other kids pop I've got, up. On I've, and I've got emails from some <laughs> spouses of. Oh, <laughs> oh, boy. It's all good. It's all good. Good energy. So thank you. That's all I had. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're on uh, agenda item number fourteen: board policy and bylaws review. All right, Mr. Young. Time of year again. Yeah. Here please. we go. <laughs> um, last week I did meet with Joe Sigbert from Viola and. He really commended us on having our policies up to date and actually having most policies that we're required to have. So uh, really going to give a lot of credit uh, Board of Education, Mr. Evans and Mr. Muccio for uh, allowing us to stay on target. So uh, we have several policies tonight, but there's, there are a theme with, with many of them. So the first two that we're going to talk about um, policy 2271 and policy 2370.01 that involves uh, alternative forms of, of instruction so policy 2271 is the college credit plus we actually just revised this policy back in September however uh, recently um, and, and you can read the policy uh, there there's a paragraph that's been added that all male students who turn 18 while in a college credit plus program are required within 30 days to register with the selective service and provide proof to the university or they are removed immediately from the college credit plus program are required to pay for the course uh, and any fees that go along with it and, and basically are listen is drop uh, that, that's what that entails so yeah, Mrs. Thrasher would say, "Does that something we have to keep track of? Uh, because you know that's it means we have to know everybody's birthday. We have to keep on track with the with the male students in the program." I said, "It's a good idea because you know, we only have 175 male students in the high school, and, and a fraction of those, less than 10 percent, are in college credit plus." But um, ultimately, it's the student's responsibility to do this. So, how are they going to know this, though? Change in the because. The reason why we're going to know this is because we are required by law to hold an annual college credit plus meeting. She's going to be introducing this. It's actually, I think the meeting was, it might have been last night. Uh, yeah, it, it was, it was last night. She already mentioned this because yeah. whether we have adopted this now or until the end of the month, it's law. Mm -hmm. So she communicated that and she is telling every single male student that if you turn 18 next year, you must register with the selective service. She stays on the CCP kids too, just speaking as a parent of one. She, I mean, she's good. She's on her stop, so she will. I get she's it great. To, we are communicating yeah. all the time. Yeah, she's. she's uh, I just see that it would be something easy to be overlooked. Which is why they dumped on us because this yeah. is this is now the third attempt to to really by law to 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 uh, to get a men that turn 18 so this is one more avenue that the state and I, I can't there were two previous passages of law to, to say listen you got to do this or this happens well there were there were no consequences to it this has a little bit of a consequence but they this this is still the 
the effort of the, the government to try to get kids to sign up when they turn 18. Males, which, which hmm? is very Males, yeah. Males, really. We're still stuck on it. Yeah. 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 I always thought you had to, but it's not. That. I obviously don't know. I, I'm serious. But you did it for a long time, you and then, 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 then it came, came maybe, yeah. Registered. You can't vote. I mean, there's a lot oh, of... Oh, you can't vote? Yeah. That's the no, thing. Okay, so it must be when you register to vote. I know, like, in my school, when they register, like, the government class would register kids to vote when they turn 18, they also get... That's We can't do that anymore, though. Oh. We can't register kids to vote. No, right. Mr. Amari used to do Just his back class. In the day. Yeah. Mr. Amari used to do it in his class, and then um, we got a letter from the Board of Elections that said we were not allowed to do that as a class activity. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, policy twenty three seventy. We also uh, point zero one blended learning. We also uh, revised this back on September twenty second. Um, this just has added a statement that. Blended learning must include non-computer-based learning opportunities. Blended learning has to have an in-person component. They don't give you the exact ratios, but they say the majority of your instruction should be still in-person, even if there is an online component. So they, they were very intentional in saying, to be blended learning, it needs to be blended, which means there must be an in-person component. Cannot be all computerized. That is not blended learning. So that's that's just some clarity uh, on that revised policy there. Uh, policy 1616, which is a new one, uh, which deals with administration. Uh, 3216, which deals with your certified staff. 4216 deals with classified staff. And 5511 is not staff, even though it's listed that way in letter F there. That's actually students. Uh, this involves dress and grooming. I have provided a guidance document to each of you that has uh, some definitions, has some case law, uh, and refers to federal law uh, with respect to what can and can't be done with things like dress and grooming in a school. Now specifically, uh, this is optional language that has been added to state that uh, to state what is legally required with regard to enforcing the dress code in a non-discriminatory manner and af affirming an employee or student's right to dress in accordance with their gender identity within the constraints of the adopted dress code, uh, specifically for students there. The language is an option because there's no requirement to include such language in the policy. Implementation of such measures is required in accordance with stated principles, whether this is in writing or not. So we opted to put it in writing because whether it's in writing or not, if you do not conform, you're in violation of Title IX and Title VII. So I provided a guidance document that goes even beyond dress and grooming for administration, classified staff, certified staff, and students. You'll find consistency across the board same expectations, uh, so, so there's no one uh, classification of employee or student that is held to a higher or lesser standard. So uh, those policies are for your review. We already have them on the books except for 16, 16 which is a new policy. Uh, policies uh, 5772 and 7217 are both revised policies. Um, that deal with weapons. Now we did adopt three weapons uh, revisions last fall, also on the 22nd of September. That was 1617, 3217, and 4217. These two policies are now brought back into alignment with the ones we previously had revised to define what the definition of a weapon is. So it includes uh, incendiary devices, explosives, and other objects defined as dangerous ordinances under state law. This definition is consistent with the revisions from the policies uh, we revised last spring. Um, 7217, however, uh, this is revised, it takes it a step farther. It's based on Ohio Supreme Court ruling in support of two statutes, revised code 109.78 revised code 2923.122 regarding necessary training for any school staff designated by a board of education to carry a concealed gun during a workday. Now that does not apply to our staff because we do not mm -hmm. 
we do not require our staff, anybody on staff, to carry uh, guns. We leave that to the police. <laughs> so, um, however, um, this this tightens up the definition uh, of that as well as weapons. Says it's important to note that the court's decision acknowledged there could be an easy legislative fix to this requirement. And House Bill 99 was introduced in February of 2021 to do just that. However, pending legislative action. School district boards of education that have authorized staff to carry concealed guns on campus should be aware of this decision. It should contact legal. Um, again, we do not require staff to carry weapons. So this is more of an update to the definition of a weapon and what is permitted and what's not permitted with respect to lookalikes and starters, pistols at track meets and it, props, props for play, the play and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. So finally, uh, Policy 8500. Uh, we revised this back uh, in May, almost a year ago, 2021. Uh, this policy has been revised to include appropriate references to conflict of interest and ethics policies that apply to food services. So if you're purchasing uh, products from a relative, family member, um, there is now provision in there about the procurement practices. And then there's also clarification on food and milk substitution provisions for students with disabilities as well as those without disabilities that require um, require specific uh, substitutions for milk products. So that has been added to uh, this, this policy for revision. And that's it. All of them are first reading and they are all recommended uh, for adoption at the next meeting. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item 15, uh, board discussion, committee reports, comments, and um, contributions this evening. The only thing I've noticed is that Mr. Evans was kind enough to invite us to the uh, staff professional development day on Friday. I Thank you. Uh, I'm going to remind you. Actually, That's your I, 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 I afforded the agenda out with some timelines on it. Feel free to join us. Any part of the day that you can be there would, would be wonderful. Uh, we're going to have lunch catered. We're going to try to encourage a little bit of socialization once the staff is today. Everybody went in their own different direction. Uh, maybe just a little relaxing time to sit and and, and talk with some of their colleagues. So uh, that's a little different for us. We're going to open up that. So. Thank you for I thank some Mr. Young and the, the the group we're putting that together. I know some of our staff members are presenting. Mr. Young is presenting. Mrs. Satterley is presenting. Presenting. So uh, very uh, uh, important topics for us that we we need to get to. Um, I will, I will tell you that in the same vein with some of the things that Mr. Young is going to present, uh, he and I had a, a, a great Zoom session with the Diversity Center this week and look forward to engaging the Diversity Center for some professional development and some programming, not only for our staff, working with the best committee and working with some things that we can work with our students too, so it's uh, just across the board. So. Well, if there's no other uh, comments from board members tonight. Mm -hmm. I said one thing. Um, uh, well, two things. Um, I, um, I was at the dentist today, and um, there's a scholarship opportunity through Dr. Hudak, dentist. Um, they give out 25 scholarships, and the students only have to write a 500-word essay, and it's service-oriented. So I happened to mention it to um, Ms. Thrasher, and she said she knew about it already, but I just wanted to encourage our students to apply for these scholarships because I know this is the time of year when they start doing that. And this is the time of the year when Mr. Evans makes threatening phone calls to the parents that you're, we have 17 scholarships available and there's one application. So, <laughs> and, I, and I'll tell to all the senior parents every year, because Bob Mantel, the Family Alumni Association will tell me, Tom, we got seven $1,000 scholarships, we got two applications. And yeah. so I will just do an all call to the seniors and say, parents, please know that there's one application in. I don't know whose it is, but for the other 61 of you, please urge your child to turn in the application. I will say as a senior mother this year, every senior got a folder yes. with the copies of the application for yeah. the scholarship. So yeah. there is no wiggle room for them to say they don't have and it. I put Tom me. talks to say I put a, we put a picture of it and said parents if you Look senior parents if you didn't get this folder ask your senior <laughs> student where it is. Yeah. So I just want to actually I'm glad we had this discussion oh. so that we have it out here so because you know the that, that is my favorite night of the year, okay. our senior night's presentation, and um, I'm just always, you know, overwhelmed and filled with gratitude for how much generosity we have in our community. So
so and it's so I mean and it's great for our students you know um, scholarships help these and three communities and our alumni and people that are associated with the school uh, just really go above and beyond as you, if you, if you have always said Mrs. Henry yeah. it's just it's just really a great night and, and that's one of those nights where that can take four hours I don't care because that's really a, a celebration of a lot of outstanding events and a lot of kids being recognized and some kids that you maybe didn't know were going to be recognized because there's such a diversity of, of where those scholarships come from and, and, and who they're targeted at. So it really, that's a great, great thing for us. And I'm, I'm really so appreciative of the way that Mrs. Thrasher's approaching that and the guidance office this year. So I hopefully in, in, uh, in April won't have to make that phone call over to the senior parents. And then the only other thing I wanted to say, they had a, the opportunity to see the varsity basketball game last night. and. I was like so in awe of what a great team that is and some really great three point shooters last night. Set a record last night. I I I, I, had, I tied I, the record. Oh tied it, he yeah. Braylon tied, Braille, Braille tied the yeah. record. Seven. Yeah. Seven but there was more than one player on the team that was making those three pointers, so it was a really well, exciting okay, game. Too. Well I jokingly <laughs> said to Braylon and, and uh, another one of the basketball players ninth period yesterday. I, as I walked through, I said, now, if you score 40 and you score 40, the rest will take care of itself. And then we both lit it up last night. I said, well, I was, I, maybe it didn't set the bar high enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they did a great job. So I just want to say that I enjoyed the game, and uh, good luck in the coming weeks. I know this is playoff season coming up, right? Basketball team seated fourth in the district. Boys, girls are seated first. Um, uh, swimmers had an outstanding conference meet. First time we've ever had a relay team, conference champion. They got... Sexuals coming up. Our girls bowling team swept every award in the conference. I went over on Saturday morning at, at the Brookgate, and they were just and the boys bowled their best game of the year uh, on, on Saturday as well. Uh, but uh, lots of really good things happening sports wise. Uh, I hear the gymnastics team's doing doing well. I haven't been down to see them. We got to get down to see them. But uh, so the tournament time. The wrestlers are coming up on tournament time. They won the, the wrestlers won the metro division of the conference. So a lot of really positive things happening athletic-wise. The plays practice in the beginning of April. The play, Mr. Michaels is happy that uh, we, we had a few additional boys kind of jump on board for the Sound of Music. So uh, he's, he's excited about that. So a lot of really positive things going, going on right now. Very good. Um, 16, future agenda items. Any future agenda items? I think we've heard about several items that are going to be considered by some new return. That's good. Um, number 17, agenda information. As you know, the Board of Education members received their agenda several days prior to the actual meeting. Thus, they have had consideration, considerable opportunity to study and ask questions, etc. 17B, upcoming regular meetings. A regular meeting at 7 p.m. on February 23rd. A work session meeting on March 9th at 6 p.m. A regular meeting at 7 p.m. on March 23rd. And a work session on April 6th at 6 p.m. We assume that the uh, regular meetings will be in the auditorium. Is that that's still the assumption? How about to be announced? Because as we get closer to the twenty, if, set, if they start setting the setup there, we may have okay. to. That's fine. We may have to either go here or the cafeteria, depending on how we need to spread out for students of the month, what have you. Very good. Okay. I don't know what the place that's going to look like yet, and I know that once they get some basic construction done, I don't want to <laughs> be messing with them. Come on, you're just seeing that. I cause, I cause little eggs with the music department. <laughs> we, we start moving tables across it. <laughs> Well, if, if that's it, then now we're up to number 18, which is adjournment. adjournment. I have a motion for adjournment. Um, Schubert, all right, I'll make the motion. <laughs> motion. Second, please. Someone. Um, I'll second. Is that a second? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's move to a vote. Mr. Dobbins. Aye. Mrs. Zetter. Aye. Mr. Press. Aye. Mr. Schubert. Aye. Mr. Schubert. Aye. Mr. Schubert. Aye. Mr. Schubert. Aye. Mr. Schubert.